Hi, my name is Sarah Pixley and I am an intern here at Historic Pottsgrove Manor. This summer I've been working on a biography in textiles, a historic garment construction project based on the life of Martha Potts, the oldest Potts daughter and the fourth Potts child. She was the daughter of John and Ruth Potts, the original owners of this historic house and the original founders of Pottstown. So, to show you what I mean by biography in textile, I'm going to take you inside and show you what I've made. Let's go! This is Martha Potts, or rather, a mannequin dressed as Martha Potts. Each part of this gown that Martha is wearing is designed to reflect something about her life or the world around her, and I'll explain each of these parts as we go along. But first, some context. Martha Potts was born on March 31st, 1740, to John and Ruth Potts. When the family moved into Pottsgrove Manor in 1752, Martha was already 12 years old. And between the ages of 12 and 14 is also the age that we know the most about Martha specifically, in large part because of the family ledgers. Her father's careful record keeping of everything the family bought and sold between 1751 and 1754 gives us clues as to what Martha may have been doing during that time. In 1753, Martha appears on the scene. She's most commonly listed as Patty and is listed as having spent money on behalf of her mother and brothers. As the year goes on, she is also given money to buy things for herself. Sundries, small things, hats, more hats, but one purchase stands out. On May 31st, exactly two months after her birthday, a payment was made for chintz for Patty. Nine days prior, a gown pattern was purchased for an unnamed daughter, and a few pages later, in July, an unnamed seamstress was paid for having made a gown. These three lines are the only surviving record of an event in Martha's life, something both mundane and unusual. It gives us a clue as to what she may have been doing during that summer, and it gives me a f into what she really wore, when she wore it, and how it was made. So, let's take a look at the design process. The gown design is a sack back gown, characterized by the long flowing pleats coming down from the shoulders, and the wide hipped silhouette that's largely flat in the front and back. This style was introduced in the 1740s continued on into the 1750s and became fully realized as an iconic pre-revolutionary look in the 1760s and 70s. Martha's dress was made before excesses of ruffles were truly popular, and she was living near Philadelphia, which was known for its Quaker population. The Potts family, and eventually Martha herself, were Quaker, although perhaps for all of their wealth they were a little less religious than some other Quakers but the Quaker influence over Pennsylvania prevailed regardless. Simplicity was encouraged, and often wealthy Quakers would exchange an excess of ruffles and trimmings for more expensive fabrics to maintain the image of the Quaker ideal while not sacrificing their appearance of wealth. Chintz would have been a perfect summer fabric for Martha, since the cotton in question was only printed in India by specialized artisans who shipped worldwide. It was expensive, required a skilled hand to make, and was so popular that it was banned in England to protect local linen and wool industries. But Martha lived in the colonies, so she was free to wear the light, breathable material, all she wanted, far from the reach of the crown. The embroidery that I've chosen to do on her stomacher serves two purposes. One, to highlight another industry that is largely unknown in the popular imagination, professional embroidery. And two, the Potts' ledgers speak to colored thread coming into the house alongside taffeta, silk, damask, ribbons, lace, whalebone, and more. The evidence of an elaborate wardrobe is stronger in relation to the Potts' than evidence of Quakerish attitudes towards clothing. And so for me, the, a colorful, time-consuming, expensive silk stomacher with detailed embroidery is a symbolic marriage of the Potts' family style with the fashion of the outside world. So now it's time to make this dress a reality. I've decided to go with a contrasting petticoat to create visual interest and to allow the chintz space to breathe and stand out on its own. 
The taffeta I chose for the petticoat has a stiff drape, which allows it to stick out from the body and helps keep the skirt looking nice and poofy. Fun fact, most fabrics were made by machine at this point in history, and almost all clothing for every social class, except perhaps the very rural, was, were made outside the home. One of the most common garments that was made in the home was a shift, an undergarment worn against the skin that protected the outer fashionable garments and was not unlike a short dress that was made entirely out of simple rectangles. But this gown is a little more complex than just rectangles, so I'm using the simplicity pattern number 8578 as a base to help me achieve the correct shapes. It's also possible to create your own custom pattern using the shape guide provided in the American Duchess Guide to 18th Century Dressmaking. But ultimately, most of the fitting will have to be done on the person who's going to wear the gown. I measured the fabric to make sure I had space to cut out two petticoat panels side by side. Since the pattern called for two of this particular shape for the front and back, and two center panels for a total of six panels. Then I pinned it down and cut it out. I cut it on the straight of grain. This was common in the 18th century as it creates less fabric waste and is relatively stiff. Cutting it on the bias will allow the fabric to stretch, but it can also cause sagging in something like a petticoat. I opted for the six panel method when cutting my gown with each panel about 20 inches across. This is because in the 18th century, silk was only available in 20 inch widths, as opposed to the 44 to 60 inch widths that are common today. Since I'm attempting to recreate a gown that may have actually been worn, I decided to go ahead and do the extra seams. However, the 18th century philosophy is make less work for yourself. So two big rectangles is another perfectly valid option. In the pattern, the panels are designed to hang nicely over wide side hoops. For me, this meant two things. One, I had to be careful when I pinned the panels together that I pinned them correctly and on the right side of center. And two, when I added the waistband, the excess wasn't going to be straight across, and I needed to remember to not try and force it. Once the panels were cut out, I used a mantua maker's seam to secure the front three together, and then the back three. It's an ingenious little seam that allows the seamstress to trap both raw edges underneath themselves with one line of stitches. So if you're looking to create this look, I recommend Burnley and Trowbridge's tutorial on how to do it. I use it a lot throughout the garment wherever I have a long straight seam with edges that could fray. I decided to pleat the dress onto the mannequin before I sewed the front and back together. This gave me more maneuverability, and made it so that I could make the petticoat a little bit larger than the mannequin's true waist. I folded the waistband in to create an even waistline and sewed all three layers together using a prick stitch and added ties at each corner. Then when I sewed the front to the back, I left 12 inches open on each side so the wearer could access the pockets underneath. All of these allowances, the extra inches on the waist, the ties and the deep pocket allowance meant that a person could wear a petticoat like this throughout changing sizes and wouldn't have to worry about making new clothes even through adulthood or pregnancy. Here is where I want to take a moment to look at one of the surviving 18th century petticoats that we have here at Pottsgrove Manor. It is dated between 1750 and 1770 and is one of my favorite pieces in the Pottsgrove collection. One thing you'll notice right away is the lack of gloves while handling this fabric. We've washed our hands well, and for most artifacts, that is more than sufficient. With the exception of metals, which run the risk of corrosion, gloves prevent the curator from accurately feeling what's in their hands, and makes it more likely that the person uses too much pressure, tears an item, or accidentally drops it. The tissue paper between the layers prevents the garment from causing damage to itself over time, and makes for a dramatic and luxurious unboxing. This petticoat is an example of a quilted petticoat. They could be made with or without lining, depending on whether or not the maker wanted it for summer or winter wear. The quilting was done in lieu of other decoration, and it was a way to show off the maker's needlework skills. This petticoat is without a lining, and the quilting is very close together and elaborate, which indicates that this petticoat was largely decorative and was intended for a very wealthy wearer. 
Lower class petticoats tended to have quilting lines that were farther apart and often were just simple bands or checks rather than flowers or swirls. I absolutely adore the color of this garment and it is incredible to imagine how bright it must have been 250 years ago before it had a chance to age. The needlework is incredibly fine, suggesting a very experienced hand, though there is evidence of reworking and possibly a modern reinforcement in the waistband. A petticoat like this would have taken months or even years, depending on the person. And although I would have loved to pair one with Martha's gown, the summertime frame and my limited schedule made it impractical. So maybe some other time. Now, back to the sewing room. While I was still working with taffeta, I decided to jump ahead and work on the stomacher, since it's another interchangeable piece that is worn underneath the gown, just like the petticoat. Stomachers are a triangular piece of fabric that are pinned over the chest to cover the wearer's stays. They are usually decorated either with trim or embroidery and can be changed out to create the illusion of the wearer having multiple outfits or gowns. For this piece, I modeled the design off of a quince tree, a fruit not unlike a pear, which grows out of pink and white flowers resembling apple blossoms. The Potses allegedly had a grove of quinces, which inspired the name Potts Grove. They never really caught on in North America, but they are still grown in Europe and are responsible for the treat Turkish Delights. While embroidery was sometimes done among the upper class, it was almost entirely for entertainment or for show. The large-scale embroidery that we see on both men and women's garments was done by professional embroiderers outside of the house. Men and women could both be embroiderers, but almost all embroidery sites had a few men on staff to work the giant looms that the fabric was rolled onto. The embroidery pattern was likely marked onto the fabric and stitched onto the loom before the clothing pattern was cut out. It took both embroiderers and seamstresses to make the most lavish garments and rarely did one person serve both functions. I did most of my embroidery work in bits and pieces over the course of the entire project. I took it with me on trains to see friends and family while I was having breakfast, when I was watching TV, and when I needed a break from traditional sewing. It was a far cry from the embroidery houses of the 1700s, but not so far off from the hobby sewing of the genteel lady. And I definitely made the mistake of cutting out my stomacher first before I embroidered it. That made it extremely difficult to put a backing on in the end, and if I were to do this over, I would definitely give the loom approach a try. So, after many long hours, here's the finished product. Now, onto the gown. Creating a strong, well-fitting lining is one of the most important parts of constructing a well-fitting gown. The lining here is made out of a fine white linen with a loose weave. This is a strong, breathable fabric that provides support without causing too much bulk. The lining is made with ties sewn into the back so the wearer can tighten or loosen the gown as needed. And all of the fashion fabric is pinned directly to the lining once it is fitted to the wearer. Typically, the lining and the fashion fabric are sewn together at the same time with both raw edges being visible on the inside. Fabrics were much more tightly woven in the 18th century and were much less prone to fraying, and therefore we see a lot of surviving garments with pinked or even totally raw exposed edges on the inside. It just didn't matter that much. What does matter is the fit of the lining, especially at the shoulders. If the lining is at all loose, floppy, wonky, or lopsided, then the rest of the gown will be too. It's difficult to see, but I ended up with some lopsidedness between the two shoulders, and it made a mountain of work for me later on, trying to coax the side seams to lay down flat and evenly on both sides. There was a lot of fudgery involved, and the seam allowance on each side is nowhere near the same. But ultimately, that is why the gown is made on the subject, so that all your wonkiness can be gently eased out without having to go back and forth, sewing and picking your stitches. Once I had the bodice front pinned on to my liking, it was time for the back. Sack back gowns are known for the gorgeous pleats that flow from the shoulders to the floor, creating an effect almost like dragonfly wings. They're quite fiddly, but not too bad once you've found a method that works for you. To illustrate what I mean, let's take a look at the multiple attempts it took me to make these pleats happen. 
I used the American Duchess book as a template for how to fold these pleats, but I would be lying if I said the book was enough for me to get it on the first try. I spent almost an entire workday watching YouTube videos just on these folds, and I was really hoping to be able to eyeball them just like I did the petticoat and customize them to exactly the perfect size for her shoulders. But try as I might, I ended up needing to take these folds apart, lay them down, and follow the pattern exactly as it was written to make them work. And I'm glad I did, because the pattern pleats match the gown exactly. Who knew? And the near instant gratification of pinning those pleats onto the dress was well, well worth the extra effort it took to make them. So with all that in mind, it's time to start assembling the rest of the gown. If you suspected that sewing by hand was the hardest part of this entire project, you would be wrong. All thanks to the invention of the thimble many hundreds of years ago, Hand sewing ultimately became a meditative and even relaxing pastime. Fitting the gown on the other hand, that is where you really and truly consider throwing in the towel and chucking the whole thing in the privy. Actually, getting the side seams to lie down was really a matter of going back and forth between the left side and the right side and the reference material over and over again to just make sure that the seam was exactly 100% where I wanted it on both sides which took approximately an entire lifetime because each side would want to pull the other out of its proper place. And every time you pinned one seam, it would mess up the other seam that you just pinned. And so you would kind of have to pin them together at the same time, et cetera, et cetera, yada, 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 forever and ever. But ultimately the sense of accomplishment when I finally got them to sit pretty was well worth it. Then I had to turn in the hem on the front of the dress so I knew about how much space I had to pleat the gown into, and then I pinned up the skirt. More going back and forth, more making sure that everything was even, and that you could still access the pockets through the gap, and I didn't film most of it because it took so long. Honestly, once this was finished, I took a three day long embroidery break. <laughs> but one must power through. So onto the sleeves. This was simultaneously the best and the worst part. 18th century sleeves are difficult in a very unique way, but I did take this opportunity to rope the actual 13 year old in my life into helping me. It was a deeply touching sisterly bonding experience that I'm sure she'll remember forever. I had to ask for her help though, because of the way that 18th century seamstresses inserted their sleeves. Instead of threading them through the arm's eye, the sleeve is sewn into a tube and pulled onto the arm and then pinned down on top of the garment with the raw edges tucked in. Then at the shoulder strap, the sleeve is sandwiched between the lining and the fashion fabric and then stitched down. My sister gave out at about 10 minutes of having her arm stuck out straight to the side and I really don't blame her. I ended up finishing the sleeves completely on the mannequin before I put the arms back in. But once the sleeve is pinned down nicely, all of the excess shoulder fabric is collected in one or two little tucks at the back of the shoulder, and I only really needed one on the left side. It was really tiny, and the rest got smoothed out. So for a skilled mantua maker, this probably wouldn't have been too difficult or have really taken that long, but for me, this was the first time I'd ever done it. Now with the sleeve set, it was time for the finishing touches. There are two parts to the decoration on this gown, the flounces and the ruffles. I started with the flounces because they go on the bottom of the sleeves and I was already in sleeve making mode. All of the ruffles, flounces, and lace that hung down at the elbow were loosely basted on instead of being really tightly secured. They aren't really put under a lot of strain so they aren't really likely to fall off, but they can be easily picked apart for deep cleaning or to be replaced entirely. I've worn sleeves like this before and I know from experience that it's pretty easy to get them messy from dipping them in things, brushing up against tables, walls, chairs, etc. Ruffles were attached with a prick stitch, just like the waistband, but in my case, I left the stitches on the back really long so that the ruffles could be pulled off and the dress could be retrimmed if someday Miss Martha no longer thought it was in fashion and wanted to do something else with it. I love the fluffiness of the sleeves and the playful look it gives to the dress, and I really like the texture of the knife pleats on the trimming, but I also just wanted to make sure that it was sort of historically accurate because trimming would have always been able to be pulled off because, well, people repurposed and refashioned their clothes all the time. 
For the flounces, the scallops on the sleeves would have been extremely popular at the time, along with the scallop pinking. Sometimes even decorative holes or slashes could be seen in the fabric. I decided that the chintz really didn't need any holes, but the pinking served a double purpose of keeping the fabric from fraying. And quite frankly, doing a rolled hem on that many curves would really take away from the lightness of the flounce. Nowadays, we use pinking shears to create a pinked edge. And you can see that I cut the pattern with pinking shears straight away instead of attempting to cut the fabric twice. But the 18th century seamstress didn't do it quite this way. Instead, she would have had a pinking iron, which was like a stamp that she hammered down into the fabric, cutting it into the shape she wanted. Truth be told, my hands were really, really sore after cutting out the fabric and the pattern as one. I would have given anything for one of those stamps. Once I gathered up the flounces and pinned them onto the dress, I decided to work up the ribbon. So I made it out of the matching fabric for a textured look, which I already said before that I just really loved. I just wanted so much texture, uh, but I had to make the ribbon too. Hemming this ribbon took me the better part of three days, and it made me long for a pair of stays to lean against, to help my poor aching back. <laughs> And stays are also pretty necessary to hold up this amazing dress. So if I ever wanted to go back and make one for myself, gotta have that underwear. So once the ribbon was properly hemmed, it was time to pleat it up and affix it to the dress. What's nice about this trim is that it hides all of the seaming sins I committed along the edge of the dress, and it helps keep the folded edge tacked down really nicely. I did eventually have to go back and finish it so it wouldn't poke out, poke out but the trim definitely helped. So here's how the dress looks all finished. And here is the finished look. The original Martha Potts received her dress in the middle of July, probably to wear when she went out shopping with her mother. Ruth Potts was most likely teaching her daughter to live the life of a wealthy businessman's wife and to manage a household. Her jobs would include running the household, looking after her children's education, and maintaining the household brand both in the home and in public. The family name was just as much Ruth's responsibility as John's, and Ruth played hostess to John's business partners and local families alike. Martha would eventually be expected to do the same, and this summer was likely the beginning of working hands-on with her mother on the financial front. Both Ruth and Martha would have been educated on reading, writing, and arithmetic, because for upper-class women especially, it was believed that an educated woman made wiser financial decisions, and understanding math led to a better understanding of value. All of this training meant that the family expectation was for Martha to marry within her social sphere or higher. Thomas Rudder was an ideal candidate, because not only was he her father's business partner, but he was a second cousin whom they had known for years. He was a known entity unlikely to change his ways or to jilt Martha, leaving her in social ruin. She married Thomas at the age of 19, and that's about when we lose track of Martha in the records. Her identity was subsumed by that of her husband. We do know, however, that she had four children, went on to join the Quaker meeting sometime later in her life, and passed away in 1804. She's buried in the Potts burial ground here in Pottstown, but for me, she's 13 and I'm very grateful for the opportunity to interact with her story as best I can with what she left behind here at Pottsgrove. So thank you for watching and come check out the museum here at Pottsgrove Manor to see this dress in person. Bye now.